meeting of the Portland School Board. Oh, we had they were like this. I have one day in the night. Okay, can we have the roll call, please? Here. 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 Okay, thank you, Patty. Can we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? The Pledge of Allegiance. Of The um, the other thing that I uh, wanted to uh, or I like doing I like doing tech work while I'm doing uh, oh, no. appreciation. No, it's all good. So it's a, the uh, the other thing I want to mention is too that uh, in that video update to the community, I also asked for people's feedback um, on approaches to snow justice. And um, and what was great was I've had I've, I've had almost 800 people now respond um, to that. There are about four questions. Uh, and people were, well, what was great is people were split on a bunch of the stuff, which is, which is the, you know, the beauty of, uh, snow days are always controversial for those reasons why, uh, but people also had a section where they could comment and there was a wonderful set of, um, even when people just read the stuff and they had very pointed, um, comments, uh, everybody was super respectful and thank you for everything you do as a school district and those types of things. So I think it said a lot about the level of class within the um, greater portion of community uh, and uh, people willing to engage in a civil dialogue uh, around uh, some of the stuff. But I will say, 
you know, the the one of the the graph I enjoy the most so far is that out of like almost 800 people, I asked one of the questions I asked was uh, if uh, if the storm the storms coming in and it's difficult to call call um, the weather in the area. Uh, if uh, would you prefer that the night before we make the call, knowing that we might be a little off because we're going to get more information? Or would you prefer that we get up in the morning and make the calls so we get better information, but you'll, well, you'll have less lead time? The last I checked out of almost 800 responses, it was 49.7%. great. <laughs> <laughs> 49.7% one way, you know, and 50.3% the other way. So it was like split right down the middle. Um, which, uh, which I think was great. So, uh, my education is old, uh, and to, uh, the students that are involved in those events. Okay, I just have a few things, and if other board members, you have something? Else? Yeah, I was just going to mention, though, in the survey, there was a mention of guardian. If in the future you could put parent guardian, there's, there's my, maybe my legal background, but guardian is a little bit different than parent, so. Sure. Um, sure. Uh, and then the announcement of uh, Don Darrow having their, um, uh, all school concert on April 11th, and um, the mention of maybe moving the school board meeting to the next week. Um, I know we have April vacation, we don't have a meeting that following week, um, but I obviously know people plan around school board meetings, and um, and also, you know, in the future, if we could sort of plan all school events around school board meetings, that would be great. Um, I know, you know, both Brian and I have kids at Dondero, um, so we'll strive for that in the future. Thank you. Yeah, so I don't know if we could consider moving it. I know that our meetings are a little bit stacked right now. We have a meeting next week. So I mean, I don't know if you know we could sort of shift our meetings with this one being shifted. We don't do that. We don't change meetings because of events on various nights. So what we can do is as we plan the calendar for next year, try to find out what's going on. Well, I guess I also advance. too if Brian and I are both out, if there's anybody else that's gonna be out that night, we might have quorum issues. I don't know. So okay. I'm just well, throwing that out there. Okay, thank you. All right, anyone else? I just have a few things. Oh, yes, Nick. Yes, yeah, so um, just a couple student events I wanted to report on. So the we had the Shamrock Ball at the middle school, um, which uh, was a, a kind of a St. Patrick's dance, but it also doubled as the unified dance, uh, which is something that we've kind of been trying to, we, we've been working with it for a while, um, is basically where um, kids enrolled in special education programs uh, the school, like it, it's an event designed so that they have a dance in addition to everybody else, um, or like alongside everybody else. And so the Shamrock, and so a lot of time we have attendance issues with this. I think in the past, the like the term unified dance kind of turned people off because they think it's something for like people in the unified club, which is an organization around that. Um, so the Shamrock Ball was marketed as kind of like a St. Patrick's dance that's also a unified dance. And it was actually a huge success. We had a huge turnout. Everybody there seems to have agreed it was one of the better dances we've had in the last few years. Um, there was original music. Kenosi was actually, a, I'm told, playing guitar at one point. Um, so yeah, it was it was a great time. And yeah, that was a huge success. And then otherwise, um, there was a student production of Into the Woods at Upside Arts, um, which was actually kind of amazing. Um, <laughs> So I, I know we had a lot of people from the high school working really hard on that. So yeah, those are the two things I wanted to recommend. Okay, I just wanted to let everybody know that um, Michelle Wheeler was elected to the Rise School Board last Tuesday night, and she is a teacher at Portsmouth High School. She teaches social studies at Portsmouth High School. So we congratulate Michelle on her victory as a school board member in Rye, and perhaps she'll be here. You know how we have an SAU 52 representative, SAU 50 representative. Um, perhaps she can come. I don't know what the protocol is for but we were excited about that. And I also attended the event at the Lister Academy on Saturday, the maple sugar um, celebration that they had. They immediately sold out of uh, maple syrup. Um, so we had to put our name on a list to get more maple syrup, but they had games for the kids. They had, um, oh, they have the coolest t-shirts and sweatshirts they sell. It says 603, but in the, the zero in the 603 is a maple leaf. It's kind of a cool t-shirt sweatshirt. <laughs> I'm gonna humble brag the tie-dye ones. Are <laughs> no, uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> but it was well attended. It was a lot of fun. It was, um, so it was a great thing. 
Um, then I also wanted to just briefly, because winter sports has ended at Portsmouth High School, and I asked Cause to send me a, um, a list of all the accomplishments that our teams had this year, and I'll, I'll make it very brief. Um, but uh, both of our boys and girls swimming team uh, placed in the uh, division finals. The girls were in eighth place out of 20 schools, and the boys were in fifth place out of 18 schools. And they were in the Division II state championships. So that was great for our swim team. Our girls ice hockey team, which we cooperate with Oyster River High School, I think most of you know that. Um, we had a record this year of, oh, wait a minute, I don't know that. Um, we were in the Division I state championship. So that was a great accomplishment for the girls ice hockey team. The girls varsity basketball team, 17 wins and one loss record. What a year for them. Um, and head coach Tim Copley was named Division I Coach of the Year in the entire state of New Hampshire. So that's quite an accomplishment. He's been around for a while, and he's a great guy. The Varsity Boys basketball team had a regular season of 10 and 8, and they were the eighth seed in the D1 tournament. Um, the Boys ice hockey team just missed the playoffs this season. So they're, they're a growing kind of team, and they're doing better and better every year. Um, the boy, boys and girls indoor track team placed, the girls placed fifth out of 20 schools and the boys placed third out of all those schools. And the competition was at Dartmouth. I remember going up there with my daughter many years ago. Um, so that's quite a, it's a state meet and it's in, at Dartmouth. Um, and then we had some breakaway, we had some records broken and our Portsmouth High School indoor track. Um, junior Lily Jenkins set a new school record in the 55 meter dash, and the girls relay team um, broke a record for the Portsmouth High School. And then Nick mentioned the unified team. They had a basketball team this year, which they've had for many years now. And they had a fabulous season. And then we have a rolling team now, which is that wasn't there when my kids were there, but they've had the best season ever. And then, of course, we have the Alpine ski teams. And the boys' Alpine ski team finished third place in Division One, and the girls placed fifth in Division One. So um, we certainly have a wide variety of opportunities at Portsmouth High um, for the sports. Yes, Nick? Yeah, actually, uh, one other thing in, in that vein, um, the robotics team uh, had our first competition a couple of weeks ago, and are, we're actually going into another one this weekend. Um, yeah, so we, we had a successful demonstration in the competition. Um, we won the Spirit Award actually for, um, I think, yeah, it was partially for the way that we ran our team. They appreciated the way we kept people engaged and they were also excited about the chariot races. Um, so, you know, uh, apparently that's something they've never seen before. And so, yeah, uh, we're going back in. We're hoping to make playoffs uh, going into this tournament. Okay, great. Yes, oh, I just wanted to say I was at the music committee meeting the other night and um, our choir has the opportunity to travel to Italy to Rome to sing at the um, St. Peter's Basilica um, in 2024. And um, at the meeting, um, in talking to the choir director, uh, we found out that my family was traveling there last year for my son's graduation. And we happened to be in the St. Basilica um, at a time when a choir was taking place. And we didn't realize it's for the event that was the that event was that our kids will be involved with. Nice. And it was the most angelic thing that we had. I mean, you could hear a pen drop. So to now see that our kids will have that opportunity to, to be the ones not filming the choir, but being filmed and being part of such a groundbreaking, just wonderful event for people all over the country, I think is a great opportunity for our choir. So they'll be doing some fundraising. They'll be putting that out for newsletters soon. So it's a district-wide fundraising that we'll be looking for. And hopefully you're going to be a chaperone. I am not. A chaperone. I can is, but I won't do that to my son. And honestly, I will say having my son have traveled abroad with the Latin and uh, program, I think it's really great if parents don't go. I think it's just a great experience for students to be able to find their own with one another and it's a real bonding experience with their teachers mm -hmm. to experience something like that. So personally, I think it's great if they're at stay home. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, anyone else? We will move on if not.
Okay, acceptance acceptance of minutes from the February 14th, 2023 meeting. Do we have a motion to accept? Every second? Second. Liz, uh, do we have any amendments? <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Motion passes. Okay, we have a public comment session. We have somebody that would like to speak on the public motion to enter. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a motion to enter? Before you go there, do you want to? Do we need to roll call with Margo on Zoom? Oh. For the minutes. Oh, that's right. I've been texting with her. I think she's with us, correct? No, yes, she is. I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? I'm here. Awesome. Yes. Oh, she was. Oh, sorry. that up a little bit. Go ahead. Good. Go ahead again, Margo. I'm I'm present. My address is 1000 El Conquistador Avenue in Fiardo, Puerto Rico. Thank you for making yourself legitimate, Margo. <laughs> <laughs> we wish we were there. Here. It's okay. a very yeah, weak. It, the connection isn't great, so I'm keeping my video off so that the audio is better. Sorry. Thanks, Margo. Okay. I, I need to roll call. We have a roll call yeah. vote to accept the minutes of the February 14th meeting. Liz Barrett? Yes. Pip Clues? Yes. Lisa Rappaport? Yes. Anne Walker? Yes. Margo PB? Yes. Marco? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Favor. Hope Van Epps? Yes. Terry Nolte? Yes. Thank you. Okay, motion passes. Now we need a motion to go into public comment. Do we have a motion to enter public comment? Liz, second. Okay. I guess we need to do a roll call for that. No. No. Okay. 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 Public comment. Um, the way public comment works, um, I'm sure Gary knows, um, is um, we speak for three minutes. Please give us your name and address, and uh, you speak for three minutes. So, uh, if you'd like to come up to the table, if you'd like to. Do they have to come up to the, that's not a microphone, is it? That is a that, that is, is a microphone. microphone, but oh all right. I guess maybe if you get closer to the table, people could hear. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gary Epler, to select the tree, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, first of all, I want to thank you all for your service. Um, I actually sat in one of these chairs a few years ago, so I know that, um, you know, given that you all have day jobs and families and all these other things, it's, um, I know it's a challenge sometimes to do this extra work, but the community really appreciates your, all your efforts. Um, so with that, um, I'll be quick. Um, I'm certain that you're all painfully aware of the recent way of graffiti and swastika were targeting Jews, people of color, and the LGBTQ community that were sprayed on Temple Israel and numerous other sites and businesses in Portsmouth during the early morning hours of February 21st. And while it was certainly gratifying to see how the community and officials and religious leaders quickly rally to counter the hateful messages, I feel that we have not done enough. Last week, a report was issued by the Anti-Defamation League, ADL, showing that these types of incidents and the groups that push them are on the rise throughout New England, and in particular, the Seacoast region, which is our community. And this trend is unfortunately expected to continue. There is active recruitment by these groups occurring online right now. We need to do more in order to counter these trends. This is a teachable moment, and we need to act in measured and thoughtful way. We need to provide our kids, our students, our children with the resources and tools and background to understand what these incidents are, why they are hateful and hurtful, what these groups represent and why they must be rejected and countered. There is certainly a place for such educational programs in our schools. There are many resources available to help communities and schools in particular, which have experienced such hateful incidents with programs and curriculum to counter them and help guide our children away from the hate and towards a path of tolerance, understanding and acceptance. 
I urge you to make this a priority, to rise to the challenge that this moment represents, and to act quickly. Failure to act now may make the task much more difficult in the future. I know that there are, um, I'm, I'm, I don't have a background as a professional educator, or teacher or anything, and I know that there are people in our community much more skilled than myself, but uh, towards that end, I would be happy to volunteer my time to helping the school board or administration or any schools in such efforts. And I'm happy to recruit some uh, friends of mine who I think uh, feel similarly um, to help with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to speak? I'm Wendy Pullen, 97 Abigail, Newcastle, New Hampshire. Um, I My son just graduated from PHS last year and attempted to head to college, was unsuccessful. Um, and I don't, I guess I'm here to let you know that these kids, and I'm sure you know, are they're suffering, they're struggling from mental health, depression, anxiety, um, their communication skills are lacking. Um, they are completely inept at looking within. And I believe that most of this has come about, I mean, obviously COVID has played into all of this, but it's been amplified by the use of their phones. And I, I am so passionate. I mean, I spoke to Patty and I actually took Ursula's tears. So I'm, I feel like the high school could be so um, instrumental in, even if you did a 30 day challenge to not for these kids not to have their phones. And, and, and it could be presented, I have lots of ideas, but it could be presented in not a way of punishment or shame, but in a way that's enthusiastic and, you know, bringing the kids together during the day or week or, or whatever, discussing like, what was an experience that you had that you resolved without your phone? What was a struggle that you had that you had to resolve because you had to look someone in the eye and talk to them? And I... I mean, my son and his small group, there's six kids that went to college and are now not in college. And I never thought that I would be a parent of that child. But these, the phones, they, they are addicted to their phones. They are addicted to their phones. They can't put them down. I, I, I like, I, tr I mean, so I just, I just feel like, um, and, and on the heels of what you were saying, I, I, I believe that there's a lot of hate and anger and and these kids are disconnected, um, you know, other than phone, you know, having the kids have to be in a club while they're staying in the high school, have them take part in the sport. And when I say be in a club so that they have to talk and mix and mingle, it's like there's the cool kids that aren't in clubs and the not cool kids are in clubs. And my son wasn't even in the yearbook because perhaps he wasn't in the group that was taking pictures for the yearbook, doesn't matter. He doesn't carry in the yearbook, but I just noticed this. There's a lot of separation. And so, I, and, and it's all being driven by the phone. So if you could, you know, do a 30 day challenge and, and you know, you could hand out a gift card. Who, who has a story that they could share? And, and everyone's sharing like, and, and I know these, these kids could, could find some, some, happiness, some health, some freedom, if they didn't have these phones on them at school. And, and, and I've heard, you know, parents, you know, what? we're just as guilty. I'll, I'll, I'll claim that because I texted my kid during school and in two seconds, no matter what class, at what time of the day, he answered me. Shame on me, but it's a habit and they're in habit too. And we need to be broken of the habit as well. I mean, it's not healthy for any of us. So anyway, that's my, and I, I would love to be in an outside forum or meeting to, to brainstorm how we can make something like this happen um, for our kids, as long as well as clubs or other ideas that might bring them together instead of push them apart. So thank, thank you for your time. Thank you, we appreciate it. <clears throat> okay, do we have a motion to go out of public? Yes. 
comments. Do we have anybody online? Oh, no. But now I believe Brian is joining us. Brian has joined us. Okay. Welcome, Brian. Okay. Do we have a motion to close the public comment? Motion to close. Liz, second. Carried. Okay, we will move on. Zach, I will let you do the strategic planning presentation. So um, we have with us tonight two, two members of the organization that we um, have um, contracted with to partner through our strategic planning process, the Great Schools Partnership. Um, tonight, our goal is to kind of lay out, uh, give you a broad kind of um, overview of uh, kind of what the plan is and where um, what the next initial steps are going to look like. Uh, so we're really lucky tonight to have uh, two folks in person. Uh, Leah Tucker is our um, is senior so senior associate, senior associate, um, and will be the point person for a lot of our work uh, here on the ground. And David Rock is the executive director of uh, GSP, and they're both here. And uh, we have some slides for you that I think will, I guess, will do the old school like, okay, Zach, move ahead, move. Is that good? All right, sounds good. So let me pull up those. Slides and if you guys, um, I don't know if you want to introduce yourselves right away or if you'd like to. Uh, wait A little bit. Yeah, I want to back up a little so I can see this. Yes. That okay? yeah, no magic. That the microphone is actually there for the first fucking sound in the whole room. I'll get you so, a uh, so the mic is in the center. So I also I also explained to Leah today. I'm like, we're gonna be in our third choice conference room for so so I'm like I hope as an organization you don't judge us based on our uh, conference. Never met before, and I you actually use the term third tier. Third tier, <laughs> yes, third tier. Welcome, <laughs> Nancy. Just Thanks for recognizing it. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. I was kind of impressed. I love the windows. Yeah. yeah. I think at one time this was an operating room. This doesn't even. Yeah, I'm not so sure I like it. It's an operating room. It has many windows. <laughs> <laughs> I've had many of them practices. I had a new employee when we were doing orientation in here, and it was like we asked people, what, what's something that people don't know about you in the room? And the person said, well, I was born in this building. I was like, yes. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> A lot of ghosts. Uh, so, Lee, do you want to? Yes, <laughs> Let me just start by saying thank you for all of your service. Um, this is such a critical role that you all play. My name is Leah Tuckman. I um, I live in Massachusetts. A former math teacher, I taught math for eleven years, and um, school leader. I was a principal in my last role, and I've also worked for the state. Um, so. DESE in Massachusetts, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, I'll let my colleague introduce himself as well. Good evening. Um, David Ruth. I'm the Executive Director at Great Schools Partnership. Um, actually started it, <clears throat> so I've been there for quite a while. Um, and we are, I, I am in Portland, Maine, although I'm proud to say that I was born in Concord, just a little over an hour from there. So. Um, so we're a nonprofit organization, and uh, we like to sort of think of ourselves as supporting schools and redesigning um, and improving learning for all students. Um, we believe in personalized, rigorous learning, um, and this is about college readiness, but as was mentioned earlier, it's also about life readiness and citizenship, as well as careers. Um, we've worked really hard on our definition of educational uh, equity, and I think that um, we really see this as three-pronged. So the first prong is ensuring just outcomes for each student, second one being raising marginalized voices, um, and finally challenging the imbalance of power and privilege that we typically see in schools and systems that already exist in schools. Um, so we have three objectives uh, for you all tonight. Um, it's a lot to, to do in a short period of time. And obviously there'll be time for questions at the end, um, as many questions as you have. But 
Our first objective is to develop an understanding of portrait of a graduate and strategic planning purpose and possibilities. We're gonna talk a little bit about the timeline and project that's specific to Fort Smith um, School District. And then we're gonna look at some examples of portrait of a graduate um, from different states, from different cities, just so you can get a glimpse. People always ask examples. It's like the first question. So now we're actually starting with that. Um, we're hoping to do this all in 30 minutes. That includes the question period. So uh, it's up to you. It's very amazing. <laughs> um, it's up to you. We have a great time to stay here. Um, <laughs> we're doing the opening now. It won't take long for that. Um, then we're going to talk about like the overview of the project as well as the timeline. Um, David's going to talk through some examples, and then we're going to take time for questions, any kind of feedback you have. So what is a portrait of a graduate? I think that's obviously the, the best place to start. Um, it's a collective vision, and it's going to articulate the skills and personal qualities that all Portsmouth public school students need to be prepared for college, career, and life. Um, why? Like, what's different than a typical mission or vision? You already have one on your website. So why why is this important? Um, and I think number one is the is the most critical piece here is the inclusion of stakeholders, and I mean thousands of stakeholders. Um, I just went through this process. I'm actually in the process of doing this in a school district in Massachusetts, um, very small school district, much smaller than this one, and. Um, we already have 1,200 survey results, and we've conducted about 30 focus groups across every school with students and teachers, alumni. I mean, we're really talking about, we, we, we did a focus group with the board, we did a focus group with all the principals, um, really as many community members, right? So bringing in people that aren't necessarily associated with the schools. Um, we tried to get a really large breadth of, of stakeholders involved, and so I think, Front and center, that is what's different about a portrait. Um, you really want to include as many voices as possible in the process. Number two, um, and I think what a lot of you are very interested in from what I hear is this connection to strategic planning. Um, this really is, I would say like the most important piece of strategic planning is once you have those themes or those characteristics that you've highlighted as most important, that's what you couch all of your strategic planning. And then finally, um, it can be really hard to get at curriculum and instruction when you look at a vision or a mission, right? A sentence or two. It's, it's very hard to sort of clearly define how this is going to impact curriculum and instruction. As a teacher, you know, right? It's very hard to do using just a mission. Um, when you get down to these six characteristics or six to eight characteristics, um, they can clearly delineate how it connects to curriculum and instruction, which is really where the rubber hits. So this on your website, um, I think it's, I think it's really good. I think it's a really great place to start. I think it puts us ahead of the game before we even start this work. The purpose of Portsmouth Schools is to educate all students by challenging them to become thinking, responsible, contributing citizens who continue to learn throughout their lives. Bless you. All right. So we put together this graphic for you as a way to really summarize the four phases of our work together. Um, we are currently in phase one, and we're actually making great progress on phase one, I would say. Um, we are laying the foundation. We are starting to think about who, who are critical stakeholders in this work, who can be a part of this committee. Um, we've already sort of presented this similar presentation to principals. Now we're presenting to you. We're starting here. Um, you are the most important people to sort of get on board before we do anything. Phase two is seeking community input. This is the surveys and the focus groups that I was referring to earlier, where we start to hear from hundreds of people in the community around what their hopes and dreams are for the young people in Portsmouth Public Schools. Um, and you can see the timelines there as well. So phase three is actually drafting the portrait. Um, we're going to do a first draft, and then we're going to put it out for public comment again. And um, 
by the time we get to the next school year, we're going to actually be able to connect this portrait to strategic um, goals and targets that really create this comprehensive K-12 plan. <clears throat> okay, so this is David's least favorite slide. Um, he, he thinks it's going to give him a heart attack one day because it's just a spreadsheet, but it, it's, it's, okay. there's a lot there's going a lot on here. There's, there's, a lot, here. there's a lot going on here. Um, Zach thought it would be a good idea to give you guys some of the nuts and bolts, but essentially I've taken the four phases and um, thought about how to really create a progress monitoring tool to keep us on schedule. Um, it can be very frustrating when someone's like, I expected a strategic plan on this date and you didn't deliver. Um, but if we can stick with these sort of mini projects within, we can get there um, and, you know, on that timeline that you have requested and that you and, and so we're committed. Was, was this made specially for us? Yeah. That's why it's in your tech. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't how you normally do it, though, is what you're saying. This no, is it's not so much it isn't normally how we do it, but like for, for every community that we work with, we'll create a timeline, a plan, steps that fit your needs. So there's a general scope of kind of like what things look like, but it varies from place to place just because of what you need, who you are, et cetera. So why is it, can you get tell us what Why don't we restrict the question then after the presentation? Is that okay with everyone? Yes. Okay. So I'm gonna, a couple more things about this, um, a little bit overwhelming spreadsheet before we move on. That is a hot link. So if, if you have access to this PowerPoint, you can click on it. Um, Column A just sh shows you our status. So, and that is up to date as of this morning. Um, green means we're good to go. We we're like doing this, we did it, or we're doing this as we speak. Yellow is we're starting to scratch the surface a little bit here. Red is we haven't gotten here yet. Um, and you can see the tasks and projects in column B. I really like to highlight impact and lift. So how big of an impact is this tiny little project gonna have? And again, if you can't see it, um, eventually, Zach will share these slides with you and you can click yeah, on it. Yeah. And it's perfect. Project lead, I think that'll mostly be either Zach or myself. Um, but you all and the committee are going to be tremendous helpers in all of this. We cannot do this without you. We should not do this without you. Uh, your voices are really important here. And then finally, um, due date. Uh, approvers there as well. I think, you know. That could either be you or Zach um, or Patty, depending on you know what the, the project is. But again, you can see the due dates there, and, and this goes all the way through phase four. So one thing um, we thought it would really be really advantageous to do is dig into one core belief or one theme that could potentially surface as one of the themes of your portrait. Um, this is taken, I want to give credit where credit's due. This is taken from um, a district in Maine, RSU 14. Is that correct, David? Uh, yes, yeah, Wyndham. Wyndham. Right? Yep. yep. And this is public. This is on their website. Um, but one of the core beliefs that they highlighted, one of their six, was transferable skills. Um, and that, again, that feels kind of nebulous. That feels kind of, well, what does that mean? How are you going to connect this to actual you know action steps in your strategic plan and so we wanted to show you exactly how that might connect um, you'll see three strategies on the left hand side um, interdisciplinary instruction so when you're thinking about cross-curriculum work you know perhaps between a science teacher and a history teacher um, the next one is around really thinking about authentic learning experiences. Um, and if you need to see that blown up, you can see the action steps in that middle column as well. <laughs> and then the last one that we've highlighted here are pathways, right? That we don't want just one clear pathway. Uh, you have to take AP calculus and then you'll go to this college. That's not necessarily the world that we live in right now. And so really thinking about multiple pathways. And I just want to explain. So, you know, the work we're doing in the front end is around this portrait of a graduate, which is really North Star, right? What's the North Star? What do you want? What do you want students at the end of this experience to be to look like and be able to do? And who are they? Um, but I wanted to not lose track of the fact that we got into the portrait of a graduate conversation because we were initially we were it was just strategic planning. 
and that portrait of a graduate is a vehicle to get us to the strategic plan. So I just want to make sure it was like, okay, what, how, and Leah talked about this before, let's say that a lot of places come to six to eight kind of um, core beliefs about what students should be able to do and what they look like at the end of the uh, experience. And it's like, well, then how do you take that and how does that translate into a strategic plan? What could that look like? So I wanted you to see a ah, example of one place that had one belief. And then how did that start to translate into the next step? Just so we didn't lose track of this, we're moving into this, what's going to be heavy kind of North Star conversation, how, how this is going to lead to the next step, which is ultimately what you initially wanted to do, which was to have a strategic plan for a certain period of time. So are you able to send us these slides? Yes, I will. I can't right now because it's on my computer and right, it's like, as soon as, as soon as I'm out, I will send you these slides. All right, so I thank apologize. You. Going what? Um, so let me jump in here with a couple of examples we have of the portrait and talk, walk you through these a little bit, but then also, again, emphasize that point that Zach has made, you know, how this leads to those next pieces that are there. And so the, the key thing about a portrait is this is as a community, you coming together and saying, when a student's in our system and goes all the way through and graduates, this is what we want these kids to be able to do. Um, and ultimately, you have a school department because of your kids. And so you want to say, this is what we want that department to create. Okay. So once you have your portrait and say, then the next question comes, if we want these things here, what do we have to do about curriculum? What do we have to do about instruction? What do we have to do about the way we group kids? What do we have to do about the way we structure our time and our resources? So all of that consistently goes back to this so that you don't find yourself having a conversation, let's be honest, that might be a political conversation, has nothing to do with kids. You want it to be about what is going to move the dial for deeper learning for kids. That's why this is so incredibly important to do this. Um, I would say this was a shift that came for us. Um, there were a lot of strategic plans that used to say, oh, one of the first things we want to do is create a portrait of a graduate. We've actually said, actually, what you should do is create the portrait of the graduate as a part of creating a strategic plan. Everything leads to that. The other piece that's important about this is if you, you know, you're creating a five-year strategic plan, five years is a long time. <laughs> and so what do you have the specific strategies five years out, despite the awesome work that Leah will be doing to you guys? Five years out, the predictability of that is hard. But what will stay steady and very concrete is this is what you want for your kids. So this example here comes out of Springfield, Massachusetts, um, significantly larger district than you are. Um, they have about 25,000 kids there. It's a very racially diverse community, but you can see they have across the top what they call characteristics about learn, communicate, persist, thrive, lead, and work. Okay? Um, I would, one specifically around the learn is really getting at all the academic learning they want kids to be there. And then while you can't see it, underneath each of those are bullets, okay? And the important piece here is that top one, and I'll read one, like, I listen to others and convey ideas of respect and openness and clarity is on the communication. That's very hard to measure, okay? But the bullets underneath that are measurable. And you want to be able to measure those so you can actually look and say, are we achieving what we want to achieve? What is happening here? Why are we not achieving some of these things? Okay. Um, so anyway, this is an example of, an, of a portrait that has led them to create their um, strategic plan. Um, this was the, the, this took them a while. And it's important to note, they did it in the middle of the pandemic. That's um, probably why it took them. But yeah, <laughs> well, that, was the, that was the reason for that, right in the middle of the pandemic. There were more than one community forum that we were there with, we got a call. Got to cancel this. So there's one example. I would also add real quick with Springfield. Um, they have amazing videos. They've done a better job capturing the portrait of a graduate process than any district I've seen. So if you just Google Springfield on our website. portrait of a graduate, or you can find it on our website. We actually watched one, didn't we? They did show you guys a part of, part of one. Yeah, yeah there's a, there, they have a lot on their website devoted to portrait of a graduate. I haven't seen that in other districts. 
So here's one from uh, Colorado. We actually did not work with these folks. We pulled it down off the off the web so you can see an example. It's here and it's looking at a, like courageous leader, creative problem solver, confident communicator. You can read down through these different pieces that are here. I think this is a solid one, to be honest. Uh, it doesn't have as much measurability as we saw in the Springfield one, which again, I think is really important to know. And then finally, this one in there from Blackstone, Rhode Island, we have helped um, with Blackstone Academy um, to, to create theirs. And again, you can see this here once you get the slides, it's a little tough to see up there, I apologize for that. Um, but around identity, learning, social community problem solving in the future. It's important to know about this one for them. You will do the same thing when you go through and figure out what are the things that we hold near and dear for the students and the families here in Portsmouth. And I think that is um, crucially important because you could have, you know, a dozen different things here. We're going to push you hard not to have a dozen different things because it's just very hard to keep those in mind, to measure those, to um, design your way around those. And so, again, it's not up for us to figure out what is the most important ones for you, but to say, you got to put these down there. You've got to get clear about those. We'll be pushing you to get it so they're measurable. And then you can actually move in and start to do the rest of your work. Um, I can't tell you um, how um, helpful I think this would be to help you facilitate some of the hard issues that you guys face in terms of budgets, policies, structures, to be able to go back and say, well, if we really want to see this, what should we be deciding? Move that back. And so this is a piece that comes back again and again and again, will lead to your strategic plan um, and will be a core piece to get community buy-in. Let me end um, before uh, we go to those next steps there, just by saying that last little bit on community buy-in. Um, you, you do not want to have a strategic plan that you put into a three-ring binder and you put on the shelf. You want to have a strategic plan that you use. You actually want to have a strategic plan that the community refers to. You want to have a strategic plan that people understand and say, those are key things for us. That all comes about from your use of it, the school's use of it, but the development that involves all those voices. Mm -hmm. And so that's why this whole piece with community engagement, getting multiple voices on that, um, hearing from, from a whole host of people and building this up, it's both to get the collection of great ideas and the involvement of everybody in community's work for. So I'll stop there. Part of the reason we included Blackstone, the previous slide, and um, Durango was because they both have this unique piece to them, right? Blackstone has the Blackstone River that sort of cuts through it. And we don't want to, we don't want to sort of push aside the importance of good graphics, right? Because <laughs> that that can be that can be something that really draws people in. It can be something that they remember. And even the Durango one, Zach, if you go back one more. Um, wayfinding was sort of front and center, right? Courageous leader, you can see a map as one of the icons. You have the the Cairn, the, the balancing of the rocks. Like th there's a lot to be said for a strong graphic design here and, and making sure that we're capturing your unique community. I mean, Portsmouth is an incredible place, an incredible place where you all live. And so how do we take our graphics to, to sort of highlight um, highlight that for you. It's interesting too. The Springfield one, they ran an art contest for students to actually create um, images of each of their characteristics. Uh, and then they had an art contest and they've got those up all over the community. <laughs> um, we were fortunate enough that we have, um, I don't know, a dozen or so of them in our office. So we don't know. But it's just, it was a, another way to make it real for the students who were there. So, Let's go back very quickly to the progress monitoring okay. tool, and then we can take questions. I David, going to be okay if we go back. David, <laughs> okay. All right. Deep for us. Um, so just next steps. Um, uh, is there a way to move this top thing over to the right? I assume it's all 2023, but I don't want to assume everything. It is all 2023. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Sure. So I just wanted to highlight some, you know, upcoming next steps. We are hopefully having our first committee meeting on April 6th. 
um, that's a Thursday. And the goal would be then to have another one on April 20th. And I've highlighted those here just so you can see. Um, these are critical, the committee meetings are critical in this process. And so really thinking about how the community can be reflected in that committee is, is sort of highlighted here. And um, Zach, do you want to say anything? We decided that first one's definitely going to be in person, um, that it's critical that first one is in person. There will be some virtual committee meetings as well. Um, and we'll prioritize having them in person when the agenda requires that, right? So we're not going to force it is what we're trying to say here. So just say in terms of uh, committee makeup, the only, I'm, I have a couple students who I'm finalizing conversations with, but um, the folks who make up the committee um, from, our, from our board are Nancy and Carrie. Uh, on the administrative side, Courtney Richings is CTE director. Uh, Shayla St. Laurent, the community, the curriculum director at the high school, um, Kay Callahan from Bandero, um, um, Assistant Mayor Joanna Kelly will, will join us, um, will, Sarah Jones uh, will represent support staff, um, she's our Kristen Keith um, from uh, Little Harbor, um, Emily Robichard, who serves in a bunch of different roles, PTO president, teacher, parent, uh, extraordinaire from um, Portsmouth Middle School as a teacher, uh, and Alexis Lang um, from Bandero, uh, who's a parent as well. Um, and then two uh, student representatives, and I'm sorry, and Phil Davis um, from the middle school. So that will be the steering, the steering committee group who will help us kind of move through the, their, I mean, their job is to help us kind of move through all that data collection and data analysis in terms of what we get from people in the community. So, is there somebody from like the union or anything like that that would be like a union? I mean, obviously, a lot of the people that might be in here so would be in. Right. are in the union, but I don't have, there's not okay. any, here's a representative of the union. Okay. Um, or rep, someone there to represent the union. Okay. Are we so at the was... point where we're going to take questions? Yes, are, you, are you guys finished? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Special ed, maybe. special ed, who's at the Harvard. So the the goal is to try to not have a committee of thirty five, and then also you know represent as many different slices of buildings and roles as we can. Okay, questions. I think I see Kerry first. Um, Zach, we're going to go to first example. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. hi, it's great to meet you guys. Um, I um, am, so two pieces of context. Um, and I think it, it, I am a college professor at UNH. So I have that experience of seeing, you know, what we heard from in public comment earlier of a very different, um, different, like, like I can't get a nursing student to, call someone on the phone period to do anything so which is actually like a whole skill set you know so um and and that on-call physicians or whatever they have to do is critical to the role you know and so i think one of the things and i'm just curious if you've seen this is like in the recent or other districts struggling with like there's just a different need for some of the like like I learned how to write a check in high school, but like they don't need that anymore, or maybe they don't need that. Um, and then that's a complex question in itself, and I'm going to add one. Um, so the other context is I, I went to Coalition of Essential Schools for high school. So like oh. South Egan, um, it was one of the first graduating classes. Um, so in, and I do curriculum mapping for college curriculum. So I guess one of my, so for instance, on this, when we have um, is, is that then a process within curriculum mapping and measurable outcome? Like that's, because to my knowledge, we're not doing a lot of, we're not doing that type of tracking currently. For our goals, <laughs> for, for a couple different directions I could go from. <laughs> okay, 
We'll just okay. We'll leave that okay. there. So, <laughs> so I guess my pro so I'm news curious. You go through the slides. The bad news is that cut part of your premise. So okay, I, I, okay, I got it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we have these goals and they're measurable, and we want to come out with that. But also, then there's there would need to be, I guess, does that get curriculum maps into? You know, yes, their requirement is social studies, but these components of um, persist are going to be in social studies in sophomore year, et cetera. Sorry, that's a lot of question. But so new, are there new phenomenons post COVID that you're hearing from other districts of skills and gaps that are missing? And also if you can tell me way on the other end, what this is gonna look like in implementing. Sure, I'll take a stab at the first question. Um, having just done this literally last week where we looked at all the focus group and survey data from another district, um, I will say that that idea of persist has come up more than I've ever seen it come up. That, um, that there seems to be this pattern of, of students right now, of young people, not, I wouldn't say giving up, but this, this like lack of interest in persisting. And so I will shut their phone off. I don't know who's ding ding over here. I'm sorry. I don't know if it's sorry. It's just distracting. That's okay. I don't know who it is either. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Um, so that's definitely come up quite a bit more. I would also include this idea of community, which feels like it should come up all the time, but that the people aren't feeling the sense of community. And I think, I think the phone piece that we heard about earlier, I, I actually think that both pieces of the public comment nicely segue somehow into this work as well. But I think this idea of having pride in your community and taking ownership of that, as opposed to this community that exists virtually that, um, that we've all sort of gotten maybe a little bit too entangled with over the past few years, probably because of COVID, but um, maybe that's just exacerbated a little bit more. But I think the bottom more of the answer to your question is this desire to be more, um, like to persevere. Um, and then there's also this desire to be more community oriented. You want to tackle the second? Excuse me, the things I build on there, a um, little on the first one and then tackle the second one. Um, those are the types of things that you want to be engaging the community to help them identify, bring forward, just the, the, the newer concerns you're talking about. And I, I note on this one here, because I remember our colleague Kate telling me the <clears throat> one that came up here was the third one down on Thrive about understanding um, financial systems to manage personal finance. Mm -hmm. And they said that wasn't in some of the early conversations. And as they went through, that one started to come up again and again and again. So I don't say that's not what you were talking about, but those ideas are the things that actually start to rise up and get in here. And then the second piece is pretty straightforward. If you look and say, we want to, we have this idea about kids persisting. Remember that top one is kind of the, the overview piece of it. The pieces you can't see real well, the bullets that are underneath there. Okay? But you, you would want to look at those and say, how do we design our curriculum to get at that? And so it could include a, a curriculum mapping to say, what are we already doing? Where are we going to address this? Where are we going to take a look at it? Which would then could lead to the question of uh, courses or structures. So, for example, um, maybe we talked about the Coalition of Central Schools, an idea of some type of a culminating event for kids that are in there or a gateway event for kids where they're trying to demonstrate that. It would have to get into instruction. Because if you just say, here's the culminating event, but the whole way through, you are never actually instructing towards that end, the likelihood of success is very limited. And it even gets into assessment because you want to be able to measure that, see if they're there. So all those pieces, actually, you've got to take a look at those and say, how are we actually going to ensure those things happen? And so it wouldn't just be like a curriculum audit. I would say, yes. And what are those other pieces that have to be in place for us to get to those things? And if I can may I just follow okay go ahead but don't have to take questions I think yeah and I think in my mind and in both places and it's like I see rubrics coming out of these pieces and that was the, like our easiest way to measure it like effective communicator and that's in 
you know, every course has to hit on that in some way or things like that. Is that kind of the how it's applied eventually? It, it, it could be. Okay. I mean, I think th those are all questions that are up to you to work through. Okay. Um, my the reason one reason I'm hesitating there is like it may not be every class. It might be a whole bunch of classes. It might be some classes versus other classes. But the, your point about a rubric is important because saying effective communicator, I don't think anybody would argue against having effective communicators. But effective, and that's where it comes in starting to create that. Thank you. I'd say broadly answer your question too, you guys based on your experience, Justin. Uh, if I'm lost, but I think it really depends district to district. The, the the grain size down to which the action steps are can really differ. So some places I think will have a certain um, an, an intense lean on curricular outcomes, and other places you won't necessarily you wouldn't see. Here's the map. Here's the here's here's the courses you can map back to the goals. You might not see that at all. Um, and, and I don't know if I feel like that's fair. It really varies from place to place the extent to which the plan is fingers are getting all the way out to like classroom specific classroom level objectives and say yes I think a reminder trust your educators <laughs> you know your your educators that your your kids are sitting with every day you've got to set a direction get an overall sense and a view of that but you will not have a strategic plan that gets down to what's happening on Tuesday. That's where your educators have got to be involved. Thank you. Okay, Danielle, I saw you on Gand. I saw Liz, Hope. If I could just add one point to that too, I think that also sounds like it depends on the core value itself because some are more direct instruction where some are more community-based. How are we encouraging this providing opportunity and how are we reflecting on that? Um, but the question I did have specifically was, when you were talking before, and I totally agree that five-year plan um, just seems huge. And so, I mean, you can't, we, we, we're struggling to plan a year or two ahead. Does that mean, or to be able to stick to it, right? We could plan it all we want, but not with, it sounds, I guess here, I'm sorry, <laughs> asking this question. What I mean to ask is, does that mean that you would suggest perhaps coming up with a much shorter strategic plan? However, more time should be spent on the portrait of the graduate values because that's what's going to last longer. And then the plan keeps reevaluating to fit that longer term. That's a great question. I mean, those characteristics are going anywhere, right? In those five years, those are the characteristics. I think the strategic plan should be a little bit adaptable, but needs to be 100% aligned to those, those characteristics. And so, I mean, I think about the last five years. I mean, how could any of us have, play, have like actually stuck with a five-year strategic plan over these last five years? And let's hope that the next five aren't as tumultuous. But, um, but I see those six characteristics. I do think that they can still be relevant um, five years later. Do you want to add anything about the strategic years plan? Piece, we have worked with some districts who said, oh, let's just do a year, and then we'll do another year, and then we'll do another year. And I would, obviously, you all get to make that choice. I would urge you not to do that for two reasons. Um, one, it's just a lot of work every year. And secondly, I think it's really helpful to look to kind of map out the five years, even if you're if you're skeptical in the fifth year, because by mapping that out, it's like this is what makes sense in year one. This is what makes sense in year two. This is what makes sense in year three. You can actually see your trajectory of that, even as three years in, you might say we need to shift some things here a little bit. But I think the absence of having that, you don't ever have a real good sense of where you're heading. So again, it ultimately comes down to you, but I don't think we would urge you to do five one-year series, five series of one-year plans. We would we would really urge you to do a five-year plan. And I would just add, like as a former school leader myself, it helps a lot with budgeting, right? If you think about one year at a time, you're, you're not going to be able to get all the things you want in that one year. And if you think about it, you can sort of 
widen that lens and have a more broad perspective of, okay, but if I can think about this over five years, I can still get all those little pieces um, in between. And, um, and, and maybe it's not five, maybe it's three to five, but I think this is not a one year commitment. This is definitely going to be longer than that. Um, I would, I would recommend five, but I don't think I would be upset if it ended up three or four. No. Okay. We have Liz and then hope. Um, I just wanted to sort of dive into the portrait of a graduate idea. We did have a presentation initially when we sort of did this of what this might be, what it might look like, um, or even not doing it at all. And so I guess my question is more so, you know, it seems like these are general ideas. We want our kids to be able to thrive and persist and do all this. And, you know, we're sort of drilling down into the lower grade levels as well as what I assume we sort of start. But my concern is that, you know, when kids graduate or the portrait of a graduate, um, these kids are all sort of going in different fields. Like there's kids that are very clearly wanting to go to college, needing to go to college. There's kids that may, they may want to go, they don't want to go to an Ivy League school. They want to go to a community college nearby. And then there's kids that want to start a job when they're 14, 15, 16, and, you know, maybe graduate high school early so that they can be in work full time, um, you know, uh, our CTE program and whatnot. So I guess, and the portrait of a graduate kind of, even though we want our kids to sort of be able to communicate and, you know, have these skills, it kind of makes me a little bit ick in the sense that how do you really define each of those kids when they're all very different? So is there a way, like, how do you sort of envision painting a picture of kids that are obviously going down different paths and what those paths, identifying and what those paths might be? and having that included within the picture, you know, the portrait of a graduate? Or like, what are your thoughts on so that? So I would say if yeah. your reaction is trying to come to this as ick, I think it's the right reaction. Because it, it, it shows the gravity of what we're trying to do, which is we're yeah. trying to take this big, you know, the biggest public entity in this community. Like the, the, and, and <clears throat> the embodiment of Portland coming together as a community is the schools. It's mostly what we're spending most of our money on. And we're making these value judgments, judgments about what, what do we want to do with the most valuable thing we have, which is our kids. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to make choices about where is our focus going to be in terms of what we want the big, the big school system to do in relation to those kids. If it doesn't feel, I think it should simultaneously feel like ick and, oh my God, this is exciting at the same time. Um, it should be like feel like a roller coaster ride a little bit um, because of the because of the fact that we get to engage in this work, which is super meaningful and simultaneously like, God, I hope we get it right. Um, because we're. We. What is it that universally um, is something we would want for all students? Uh, regardless of the, the path they follow within the U.S. So, so sorry, I didn't mean to steal the. I would just add that um, when I think about a content center, right, and I'm going to use a math one because I'm a former manager. Um, not every kid is going to need a system of inequalities, um, right? Like you give a few examples of a kid that goes to a community college that goes to an Ivy League versus a kid that jumps into a job.
I think comes in. I think I think the question is for all of you and the broader community you engage in this is to say what is the what are the core things that we want our all of our graduates to get? So that's a big question for you. And you may look at this and say, there are some things. These are nice to have. I would like some kids to get this, but I'm not necessarily committed to all kids getting these pieces. That's the question you're going to have to look at. There is no doubt when the kids go through your system, the set of skills and capacities they get are going to vary. We just know that. It's there. But what this is saying here is essentially putting a stake in the ground and saying these things, we're committed to all kids getting these things. And we're committed to measuring for all kids to get these things and we're committing to setting up structure for all kids to get those things so you know, carry your question of how does this impact these other pieces there's a question that's going to be for you guys to look at and say what do we do when kids don't get these things how do we step in and help with those kids what are the results of that those are all questions you're going to have to uh, wrestle with moving forward and not just you but your schools and your teachers okay hope <clears throat> So I'm just going to talk for a minute talk through some things because I've been listening a lot and then kind of come back to a question. So I guess um, one of my concerns that I think about is we talk about inclusion and equity and we talk about a portrait of a graduate, right? What does that look like? And how's that going to funnel up for all graduates? Um, obviously, we're not going to define something that's going to touch <clears throat> in perfect definition to everyone. Um, but I get alarmed sometimes when we talk about this language because it really depends on who's writing the story mm -hmm. and who's writing the definitions of these things. I'm, I'm a little alarmed with the committee. I'm not gonna lie about that because I, I think Shay is incredibly smart and I'm so glad she's on the committee from PHS for curriculum but I don't hear a lot of representation from PHS. And so I have to ask myself, is that because we're already up against um, a lack of buy-in or engagement in the process, or is it just people's time or um, is it an oversight? Um, I hear representation of elementary school, but again, it's heavy on one side. We have a principal. Do we need a teacher from that same school, or are we better served in another building? Um, because I think we want to see through multiple lenses, and if we're not starting from that place, from a steering committee standpoint, that that can be concerning to me. Um, and and even no offense to our board members, I think that they you have you're a history guru of this district and I know you know so much about it that I can bring to the table but there's no representation of, of parents from PMS and PHS that are current and that is crucial knowledge in this district as well so I guess I, I look at all those components and I think where are we starting from and when we talk about we're going to get feedback from all stakeholders that's easy to say parents, community members. But as we learn with our super you've got to do that across from social economics. Um, our district, I'll tell you now, it's not set up for that. I mean, there's a lot of people that you send out a survey, they can't read it in English. They didn't understand what the role of a superintendent was. They're not going to understand what the role of a strategic plan is unless you have someone go into the housing developments as we did and go door to door with the survey in Spanish and explain it to them. We cut out that portion of our population a lot in this district. So you can't develop a portrait of a graduate unless you're really gonna dive deep. Otherwise you're gonna get to me a very shallow definition of what a portrait of a graduate is to a very specific demographic in this community. So I guess I, I would pose to you, if you're hanging your hat on portrait of a graduate is stand out different because of taking information from all stakeholders. And I would argue to say that any strong consulting plan of strategic planning does that. So I'm not sure that that really does differ, 
you make a difference to, to me as a board member. I think it's crucial. I'm glad you guys are doing it, but I don't think it's anything unique to a strong plan. Mm -hmm. So I hope there are other variations for portrait of graduates than just that. But I would like to understand how do you make sure, and Zach, how are you going to make sure that we do get a collective representation of our community? Because our community has right now a very wide gap. We're two communities with a very wide gap. And we often hear from one community. And so I'm just concerned about that because I know that as, as great as this layout is, as as much as I've advocated for everything that you're sitting here for in the last few years of serving on this board, and as much as I think no matter what we do, if it turns out good or bad, just this community going through the process for the first time in their lives asking these kind of questions is so essential to the progress of this district. I just want to make sure that we are looking at this from truly from all stakeholders, because you can have variations of stakeholders that are still sitting there from all the same perspective, all the same social and economic brackets, mm -hmm. all the same schools that they're representing parents, but they're not representing parents in the district. So can you speak a little bit to that? Of like, how are you gonna assure that in this process? Okay. And how are you gonna assure that with your steering committee when it's, it's you know, not quite balanced? <laughs> That, so you know, I, I just say of the schools. So when we have two students who added, PHS will have four members of a of a fifteen member committee. Will be PHS. So, that's two students, but not staff. One <laughs> staff, right? Um, so yeah, Courtney, Courtney Richens. Oh, Courtney. Okay, and, I'm sorry. And Chen. Okay. So um, so it'll be four, and the next closest school has two. Okay. So. So again, part of this is around manageability of size no, and it. trying to, and, and what, you know, and so how, so the goal was to, so we've got administrators, a uh, community member, two students, um, two teachers, two parents, support staff member, uh, two board members, uh, and me. So, uh, and then every, every school has representation. So, so it's so weird. I think it's part of it is the balancing act of trying to um, of trying to get uh, incorporate all those different roles and not have it blow up. And can I ask, like, are those students are they superstars, or is one maybe a superstar and maybe one? So I, not one that's not, not a superstar. superstar. So, so I don't. So, 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 so I don't. So I don't, so I don't, so I don't, so I don't want to. I don't want to speak. I don't want to speak to the students until I know the girls. So, but I had uh, two students who represent who were recommended to me, and I want to make sure I once I know. So I don't want to characterize students that may or may not end up being. But okay. I have students that. Have I mean, again, I, I will say that is something at PHS that we often pluck, the, and we do that in our society, right? We pluck the ones. I mean, you go to any college tour, you don't see someone <laughs> giving a college tour that's not in fifteen different things in the campus, like. Definitely. You know, and they could be a superstar student, but maybe they didn't involve So, so let, me, let me start by saying I, I could not agree with you more. Thank you for speaking. Um, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that the committee is totally set in stone. Hmm. So that's, that's, that's where we'll start. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the focus groups. I actually got into it a little bit with an assistant principal in this other district I'm working in. Because I said, I don't, I don't want your superstars. I don't, I don't, I mean, not that everyone isn't a superstar. I don't want the A plus students. Um, and she was like, well, I'm not going to give you, I was like, maybe I can go, come to like detention one day and recruit a few kids. Maybe I can walk. When we were doing focus groups in my school in Revere, um, which is where I was a school leader, we actually walked and took the kids that were kind of in the halls, like avoiding class a little bit because we wanted to know they're like, why don't you want to be in class? Like you're clearly not excited or passionate about being there. Why? And I think those are some of the voices you're right aren't necessarily heard. Um, I would also say that in, in my last district, when we did focus groups, we specifically we knew that the top three languages were Spanish, Portuguese, and Arabic. 
um, besides English that were spoken in our school. And so we translated, and again, like you said, it's not enough to just translate. We also had uh, like family liaisons that were available to support the people taking the survey in not just translating, but really understanding the colloquialisms, like the, the actual, like what does this mean? How is this gonna impact your student that you have in this building? Um, but all of this comes back to me saying, yes, I agree with you, Hope. I think what you're, what you're raising here is the most critical piece of all this, that the focus groups are a mix of kids, a mix of parents. Um, my colleague just said, we need to do another focus group, even though we've pretty much already come up with like the, our themes for this district. They said, we need to do another focus group. We haven't heard from enough uh, special ed students and special ed parents. And so we're going back to the drawing board. And I, we really, truly want to get a breath here, um, not just those eight plus students. Well, I really like what you just said, and I have that's probably a really question. I feel mission about working to get people to from all these sectors of community. And then you do focus groups. You want to make sure you're hearing all those voices and you're clearly taking notes in focus groups and you know you're always in. Um, what I don't want to say, um, we look at that and say, well, this idea came up 72 times, so it has been going towards because sometimes a singular person might have to do this. Idea that you need to think through. And so um, that's a little bit of kind of the nuance that has to go through. I just want to be clear about that. It's just not a, a straight, oh, check, 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 check. That one got a lot of checks, and this one didn't get a lot of checks, while realizing um, there's a bunch of like the economy, but that's the whole breadth of ideas. I have a question here. I'm always a little bit on the question because I'm going to be able to do it. But I have to say that at least one board, I think it would be somebody who has a grant, right? But it's more of a small and just 
Um, and not for everybody, but but half of us could turn over every two years. Um, so I'm curious if you've had experience with that, where boards, school boards, are shifting frequently, and how that, how if at all, that impacts the portrait, and whether that portrait changes when when the board dynamic changes or if it tends to stay the same. Um. <laughs> We've actually worked with a couple of districts that had um, um, turnover of superintendents, yeah. key district leaders, and um, school board members. Mm -hmm. The key thing on that is really about the outreach to involve the communities. Mm -hmm. Because if if this work is yours, you you may have that problem. Right. If this work is the community's. I mean, I can't guarantee anything, but the likelihood of a problem is really small. And so um, we have worked in a couple of districts that have done this. They did a really nice job of getting all voices to the table, of, you know, hope you're concerned of making sure all those voices are there. And when they've had changes, it hasn't changed things. Um, and so, I, I mean, that again, that's what I think it's that step is so crucial because it is about. If you're building a plan for the community, the community's got to be a part of that. Okay, Danielle, <laughs> this might be a funny suggestion. I thought it was funny, but it might be worth considering. Just in light of some of the conversation from today, I'm wondering if doing some trainings with kids on how to be in-person survey takers or on phone and making calls to do that interaction may end up broadening our reach, right? Getting people in the community. Skill building, you can tell the dynamic educator, but it was- It's a win-win. <laughs> <Yeah. in> <laughs> they already do that for Psych 101. Psych 101's project is everyone makes a survey within a class on a particular topic, so. But almost to just strangers really integrated yeah. into our curriculum, That's and then to teach them how to go do door to door and take the data and collect the data and figure out the demographic. But it's not. I mean, we talked about the fact that part of yeah. part of the work, part of the work of the steering committee, which could expand the yeah. next couple of years, um, is to it's going to be to train. We're going to train some of those people up to conduct focus groups. This is not all going to be. I mean, we want. You know, GSP to do some of the work on the ground, but it's still not going to be able to cover everything without some of our own folks being trained to be to run folks groups. You know, so that I love the idea. I love the idea of students as data collectors amongst their peers. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and getting the right network of students to 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 get kind of the real scoop kind of on stuff. I think is it's really intriguing. So. Great idea. I just have one final question. Do you feel the deadline is achievable? Oh, April 2024. Is that what we're looking at? April 2024. Mm -hmm. the, 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 time, the timeline that we've gone through, we feel is achievable. Okay. 
I know some of us were concerned about that. So if we know we can get there, that would be awesome. I mean, let's hope we don't have another pandemic. Well, but you know, <laughs> 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 yes, not, not good or, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for an excellent thank presentation. Thank you all. Thank Everything you for us. And thanks for all you guys do. I would also just add our email addresses are on the PowerPoint that you've all received at this point. If you have additional questions that weren't answered, you can always reach out. And um, we want to involve this group as much as you want to be involved. So we will keep you updated on the process. If you ever want us to come back, please invite us. Um, you know, we want to involve you as much as you'd like to be involved. So thank you. Is there already the meeting time designated for these meetings so that all the committee members have committed to being available at that time as well? So part of the reason why we were going to originally, we we're hoping to meet for the first time of this Thursday. Yes, yes, yes. We had some conflicts around PTOs and PTAs, a couple other things. Okay. So that's why we actually moved, so you're meeting in the we evening? Moved to, yeah, we're doing the evenings from 6 to 7. Okay. So. With the hope of getting as many people involved. That's right. Today. So will the updates be coming from you, Zach, on this process? I think that's the plan, but although we'll periodically pull we get back in to have some some have some dialogue for that. So we'd love you to stay for the rest of our meeting if you'd like. <laughs> so they're they will leave. Very great to tell you that we were going to do this. I've got another meeting in tonight. Oh, and, 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 thank you guys. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Oh, oh, no. oh, All right. So you're going to over here. Yes. yes. Superintendent report. Right. Let me get it in the midst of. Let's pull back up. So uh, you have a couple things in your packet um, for me. First, just a uh, memo. I wanted to make sure you were updated because while we talked about um, what we wanted to do with the CIP, the, uh, the capital improvement plan for the city, uh, we've had an ongoing conversation about how we're shifting money connected with, with ATSER so we could free up money towards project at Lister. Uh, and we have been involved in a series of meetings after we came to those conversations. We've been involved in a series of meetings with the city uh, around setting um, that uh, um, capital improvement plan. And I would just say, there's sort of additional, the, the, the overarching thing is we have a lot of things that are in the capital improvement plan, which spans over um, you know five to six year period of time. Um, and um, so those things are in there. A lot of the conversation this time around has specifically been around Lister and what's going on with Lister and having this dialogue with this council. Um, ultimately, at the last meeting, we scaled back the, um, we were asked whether or not we felt it was safe, scaled back the what was going in by, two, I think it was $200,000. Um, we, we agreed and thought that was, uh, that was possible, but you know, we'll still cover all of all the costs. Um, and, um, and so that went through. So the CIP has been approved. Um, Lister as part of that has been approved. And um, and the only other thing I'd say is too, just in general, I think, you know, I want to give Nathan a lot of kudos for being a connected issue with the state. Uh, Nathan does a lot of work in his role um, where he's overlapping and applying with city finance. But just in general, in terms of the quality of um, Nathan's work, when he presents to the city council, um, he does an excellent job with the one, but he has a ton of credit. So when we want to advance projects through that process, um, Nathan's a super valuable asset. I just don't want to lose track of the fact that Thank you. Nathan, so thank you very much. Um, you know, one other thing I mentioned in that vein, just in the in the uh, Lister vein, which was not in the memo, but it was a meeting we had this afternoon. Um, we've been going through a series of there's been a series of meetings. That I have not been um, uh, I've been involved in, but not on a regular basis. Where lots of conversations with staff and students uh, at Lister about what the needs are with uh, architects from JSA. Um, we appreciate the fact that you had authorized funds. Remember, I think back in October, maybe we'd asked you to authorize some funds towards you know towards doing some of that work with JSA. So 
even this afternoon, we were having some closer to final conversations with, with um, JSA um, around some of the finishes and stuff that will be involved in the project, where it's been a lot of work back and forth with the architects. And um, I know, Nathan, you're going to do an update in our next meeting about that process, so maybe we just leave it till then. But, yeah. um, and all of our capital projects are standing. We'll update the next one. Great. Okay. Any questions on the IP list? Okay. Are you still on school board? Uh, let's see. Course. Email summary is in there. Field trips. Um, again, these are just to keep you up to date. To two different uh, field trips that we approved. That includes the the, the one that Hope was discussing uh, earlier tonight about uh, Rome for next uh, next year. So. Um. I had received, I think I received emails about the um, um, AP program. I don't see that in this. I don't know if that's going to make it to the next meeting. If that's why we can do an update at the next meeting about kind of the the, uh, the process for. I don't see that even in the correspondence. I don't think here. It's only to March eighth. Okay. Is, yeah, this okay. is all leading up to the original schedule date. Okay. And then you said you would give us a sort of update on that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, right. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Italy trip has actually been extended to eighth graders, just as a quick the, to that. Okay. Yeah. Well, eighth graders have been invited. Invited. Current eighth graders? Yeah. So yeah, 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 yeah by the time they don't get eighth graders. So I have a eighth grader who's in my ear about how they should be sent. Yeah. Um, but, so, but clarify that. It's an yeah. approved ninth grade trip. So yes, it will that's be what eighth be graders that will be the B ninth graders of one trip date. Yes. yes. That's St. Peter's Basilica. Like the, yes. That's one. Like the St. Peter's Yes. Um, uh, in addition, if you have uh, letters of res resignation, there's just notifications that you've received exactly those and you hold those positions. I have a question on the side of the table, Nancy. Oh, yes, Carrie. Um, so I know that, so two questions, one about the special needs. Um, I know that we received correspondence and um, I just would love some minor update on like that that is being worked on. And then regarding the trips, I was just curious, like, from uh like risk man, like what is required and it doesn't necessarily need to be tonight but even if you sure. can provide it as an fyi like what um safety security everything is part of those yeah. trip authorizations so we see we can do for a future it, it can, I don't know. it's covered <laughs> yeah it's sure you have it, it covers me it's yeah. If there's like so we for travel I mean, the short version is we will ask on our international trip if there are if the State Department has warnings around certain areas or activity. Okay. So if we, um, for example, in one of the uh, one of the trips in here includes uh, in yeah. yeah, and so there's a there is a level two warning for certain yeah. parts of things and mm -hmm. all that we're aware of that. Mm -hmm. So and the actually going on the trip would be dependent upon. Getting the most up to date information from the State Department and then they can but we would not send some students to, okay. uh, to an area where the State Department says we should not. So, okay. Yeah. And I guess my other question with that was just like, I mean, I do this for my work, so we have yeah. huge, huge risk management things. Yeah. So, like, can we require malaria prophylaxis, all the vaccines, all the recommended things? Because that's another the great question that I. And I would say is not is not part of the checklist that I go through in terms okay. of the approval process. Um, but I can come back to you with more information in terms of what is happening at the future level. Uh, in that regard. And it's a good well, question. It's a good thought. It's a checklist of required what's required for that particular travel. So all of so the we yes. travel to places where you need a malaria shot. Right. If, so not yeah. yeah. But the, uh, but, but the, uh, you said, and that's through third party 
enemies, like yeah. Um, so very okay, often gotcha. they, so, that, so they're not running because yeah, they get their own insurance. That would actually issues. address my question because, yeah. like, knowing the agency, because yeah. to me this was like Isn't a teacher that kind of going needs of operations though. But that kind of micromanaging operations, like I think it's going back to like yeah. trust yeah. Me, yeah. Can carry, you can carry. So. No, I mean I totally no, hear that. that. I understand. I so there's a lot of risk and that up. different risks in those trips than there are in going to over, you know, outdoor ed school. Right. So um, it'd be like, that would be a cool thing just to add maybe yeah. if that would satisfy yeah. my and question. It, yes, and I can I can take a look. But like I said, the vast majority, I, I, want, it's, I, I want to say exclusive, but I'm not going to say exclusive. Um, but the vast majority of our trips abroad are three really third. It's not bad. It's perfect. Yes. So, then I know they have We have a staff that's in Africa Here. right now. Oh, are we going in order as far as being called on? Here? Right, I mean, let's, I just, let's you know, it's like, let's let's okay, let's let's you're answering it like you're Zach, and it's a little inappropriate. Let's 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 yeah, understand from our super. Yeah, but you haven't been called on. I'm not speaking to you right now. Okay, but you haven't been called on. So, so I'm we're trying to have a big Thank you. I'm just trying to understand why we need to even go down this rabbit hole and use your time for that because we have staff like, I mean, McGrimley's going to Africa. She's going to address her own shots and her own right. needs. And right. you're right. We've been running these trips forever. We have third parties that check the boxes for this. Right. I mean, our music director is taking a preliminary trip right. to clear everything before our students even yeah. travel with them. I feel like this is, we talk all the time about staying in our swim lanes. This is micromanaging. And I just feel like it's a waste of your time. Okay, it's a well, waste of time. I know we'll do what Marco, Zach, and I will discuss it in our pre meeting and decide whether we're going to make a short presentation to the board at our next meeting. Okay. May so I just edit that my request was not a short presentation? Uh, um, knowing that it's contracted trips satisfies my question. Okay. It would be great to see on there just contracted with EF. Okay. okay that so we'll do a short presentation based on. Oh, no. It, no, I'm just saying this. Item of information, this adding one little column. Okay, okay. That is my request. Okay. So if okay. you could discuss that request. Okay. Okay, we will do that. Does anyone else have a question about this? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Let's move on to the communication plan. Okay. Um, I, I don't have a bunch of slides for you. We've, we've looked at a lot of drafts. And we have the, the final draft. Um, what I can, I'm happy to take questions about the content. Do we need to, I'm sorry, do we need to approve these letters of resignation at all? No. Okay, that's okay. Notification. Okay, sorry, thank you. Uh, the, uh, case plan, uh, happy to answer any questions people have about the content plan. Um, I'm, again, I want, I want to, we, we went through a couple rough conversations about it and I, and I want to, you know, acknowledge that and appreciate the, the desire to have something that's meaningful uh, and is going to move the district forward around communication because that was such a big concern in your process of finding the leadership. So, um, so the other piece I'll mention is my in terms of this being accessible to the public. Um, my, our my plan is to is to put this into onto the website, not as a PDF, but have it as a web based thing that people have access to. Um, it'll be a tab off of the district village. So um, so that will be coming soon, um, but it will take a lot of the same, you know, graphically it will be a lot of the same material, but it will just be reformulated in a way that is a little bit more accessible to the public and an easy place to work to. So, but happy to take any questions about it. Does anyone have questions? Pip. Um, I don't have a question so much as a um, comment. I just wanted to thank you for taking our feedback in the previous um, conversations about this and, and putting it together into something that I think is quite shareable now. Great. Um, and I think will really be helpful as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Liz. Um, I know, like, in, um, I, I don't know if you pulled all these graphics together yourself, but this is uh, really pretty here. And, um, but the only thing that I was thinking of as far as audience go, I don't know if there's a certain specific audience for, um, I know there's it, it says employees and community at large, but I don't know if there's a specific audience for um, administration or city officials. So like I'm thinking um, police, uh, city council, you know, certain target audiences that sure. are um, uh, more official related or city official related, I guess. Um, 
you know, in that in that communication. So, um, first, I can tell you that. I, so, it didn't in terms of. Um, uh, I'm not a graphic designer per se, but I did not. I can I can promise you on the other end of the spectrum. I didn't go on the <laughs> web and put in tool uh, communication tool graphic and then cut and paste something from somebody else. Um, I, I used uh, I used a, a, a platform that has some templates around some design stuff and then and then edited those te those templates and stuff and mess with that. So the um, so the uh, om the omission of kind of municipal officials as a separate category is my own. Um, but I do that while not there in the graphic is a, uh, is a really important thing. And we do a bunch of stuff that has grown even in the last couple of months in terms of uh, inclusion of, of, um, of this manager, Department of Public Works, Police Department, Fire Department, Crossing Guards, and a whole, depending on what the types of communication are, um, parking, um, those folks are receiving, when I push out like snow stuff, there's a, we have a list and a, a means of communicating with all those folks around snow. If it's around emergency, we have a different crisis set, set up of communication where now, if I'm pushing out stuff to the community or to administration around a crisis, city manager is also receiving that information. So we're, we're building all these kind of structures um, so that, um, we're all keeping each other, you know, in the, the two sides of this building uh, in the loop as much as we possibly can on the things that are, are crossing over uh, into each other. And that's growing all the time. Um, but um, but we, we keep trying to build on that. This is great. And then who did you, I mean, who did you work with to come up with this sort of, this complete complete picture here? I mean, which, obviously which one, you've uh, collaborated with a lot of people, but I mean, um, I think you've really done a great job summarizing. I mean, well, I why did we just hire this company? I think you could probably do all that. Well, <laughs> I think, so, so I was thinking, first, so of, first of all, I benefited a ton. But... Yeah, I, I benefited a ton <laughs> from the work that was already done by the communication committee over a course of years. Okay. So the the core themes about what the goals were were, were plucked almost word for word from the what the communication committee okay. had done. Um, so I tried to take those goals and then build upon those things. And then I got a, a lot of really, you, you, all of you gave me a lot of, uh, you know, uh, feedback about what you wanted to see. And so, um, and I'm happy to receive feedback, uh, and then try to, you know, try to answer those things. So thank you. But a lot of it, a lot of it goes to the communication committee and the work they had already done over the course of the each year leading up to this. Okay, I just want to be clear on where all the stuff came from. Thank okay. you. Any other questions? Lisa, I have one question that's probably for a later time, but it looked to me like you have some budget stuff for Buffer, yep. and you have a lot of stuff on your calendar for Parent Square. Yep. And I'm curious, um, are we sort of committing to Parent Square going forward? Because I didn't see it in the budget, but then I see you have a lot of steps on that. So I was just trying to understand what your thinking is around, is that where sure. we're going to stay or are we sort of evaluating? So I don't, I don't, that? so at the moment, <laughs> so I don't, I don't think, so I think, so I think parents, the future of Parents Square is linked to the future of our ongoing connection to the city website. Okay. So I see those two things as they're okay. like, it, it's symbiotic. And so if we're going to, so those two things are kind of happening simultaneously. What I'm trying to say is squeeze the most we can possibly squeeze, do all the things we can, do everything we can possibly get out, get out of the thing, the tool we already have, because switching tools takes a bunch of institutional bandwidth, right? Okay. Yeah. And then same thing with the on the city side with the website. There's things the website does that are great. It's good to be integrated. Um, there's things that we don't do well in terms of the way in which we're uh, utilizing the city site, but there's also some features that appear, features that are that are that other school districts are using connected to other platforms that work better for K-12 that are not, appear to not be present in what the city system has available to it. So we're so anyway, so we're going to try to squeeze as much as we can squeeze out of those two tool those tool 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 two tools. Thank you. Uh, and then on the, I know don't ask me to do it again. Uh, and then uh, so so the short version would be in the fall we will not have a different we won't have a different we won't be utilizing a different tool in the fall 
we will be maximizing what we got. And that includes our presence on Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, as we move into using, utilizing Buffer okay. as well. So, so I didn't see Parent Square in the budget. Is that because we already signed like a multi-year contract and there's just not? That's, good, that's a good point. I, didn't, I, I just have it as assumed. Uh, oh, okay. so, and I didn't All have right. it as a comparison thing. So, so no worries. Just, oh, wait, follow up. Are you finished? Yeah, I just wanted to under, I just saw it now there. On our contract with Parent Square, something yeah. Lisa and I never got an answer on. Yeah. <laughs> Is there are higher tiers of Parent Square that can do more yeah. things than our yeah. limited version? Are we looking at those tiers? Um, if they can be better integrated into our current system? So I haven't started that process yet, okay. but I would say part of so, the kicking the tires of maximization would include you know, if we had the full suite of everything that's available through Parents Square. So that costs. could be a budget adjustment. Yes. Yep. But, okay. Yep. Thank you. Nathan will figure that out, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Put the line over there then. <laughs> Any other questions about the communication? Well, thank you. Oh, you know. That was a stretch. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Zach. This is the. Um, Conclusion of a long process, and we appreciate everybody working so hard on this. And we appreciate the input of our superintendent. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to confirmation of previously approved sabbatical proposal. Again, Zach, that, that's you. No, this is uh, oh, okay. Dr. Haynes. Is, uh, I think it's a tough one. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. So you have a link in the agenda, the memo that I put together, and the or, the letter of the original proposal that Allie McGrimley had sent to the board back in 2020, uh, the board at the time approved for a sabbatical to happen in the summer of 2020, which we know what happened in March, and everything came to a screeching halt. At this time, she is ready to take the sabbatical, um, especially since I believe next, no, in May, they will be dropping the emergency declaration for COVID and things will be sort of back to normal. So she's ready to do that. And at this time, I would just ask that the board um, make a motion to confirm that this will be happening um, for school year 23-24. Can we have a motion? Yep. Second. Second, Lisa? I guess we need to take, oh, any discussion? We need a roll call vote. Liz Barrett. Yes. Fifth. Yes. Lisa Rappaport. Yes. Ann Walker. Yes. Margot Peabody. Nancy Claver. Yes. Hope Van Epps. Yes. Brian French. Yes. Terry Nolte. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Margo. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Came across the ocean. We really got it. Thank you. Um, okay, now we're into new business. Um, Zach, do you want to talk about the school? Sure. I'm gonna and I'm gonna pass her around in both directions. In addition, that we want to add to the back of the school calendar for the upcoming year. Uh, and I'll you know, I talked about this and what this is. Sorry. Right, this is still So in, this was not, this is not, uh, was not included in your packet, but our intent would be, this would be on the back side of the, um, of the calendar. So when we first talk about the calendar, um, the, so the calendar is a, the way in which the calendar comes together is the APT, uh, the Association of Enforcement Teachers, develops a draft, um, and that then comes to me. Uh, it's something to share with me. It's something to share with the superintendent and SAU 50. And then we work to get, we collaborate together to see if there's any any adjustments that we're going to make. We have conversations with the APT as we do some of that work. Um, we I apologize that this has not come to you sooner. There was there was interest, and I include this in my memo around doing some calendar adjustments. And there was, I think there's some conceptual agreement between the Teachers Association, uh, building leadership, uh, SAU 50's uh, superintendent. We all, coming around. Just the calendar that we don't have. The calendar. The calendar. The calendar. Yeah. 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 In the calendar. Yeah. This is yeah. the back. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, we'll have to try to say this is the no, place to be there. Oh, yes. You're talking about this, but nobody is thinking that this is other recognized topics for me. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll come back to that. So, the, um, so anyway, so you, you see the graph. Ultimately, the, what the, the calendar reflects really looking very similar to what we did this year. Uh, it's not, not no big changes. Um, and uh, all parties agree that in the moment, this will, can, will you know, we can move ahead with this and it works for folks, but we have an interest in returning to the conversation for something that we could show you in January of next year for the next year. So, and go ahead, oh, and then I'll come back to, to the other piece that I just sent around to you. Um, for those at home, uh, it, it is a list from um, the Council of um, Presidents, which is an organization out of Washington State, but it's not anything special uh, connected with them. They're just a group of, uh, of uh, colleges, uh, and what they put together is uh, a list of major holidays uh, across some of the major traditions. Uh, and this is something that I, I know in some conversations, equity-based conversations that we've been having in the region, uh, we've been talking a lot about how can our school systems be more inclusive. Now, I've had some recent dialogue very late in the game on the heels of some of the um, some of the graffiti and hate speech that was um, spray painted within Portsmouth around the idea of altering the calendar to include um, uh, some of the Jewish holidays. And I think the, the feedback I gave at that time, because this was already gone to you and that we're already late in the season, is that I think I have an interest in having a bigger conversation about the actual inclusion of, of some of the, some, um, I'm having a broader conversation about Days we might actually give off in our calendar that are not that are not directly exclusively connected to um, Christian holidays, uh, and whether and having to be more inclusive of a variety of people and traditions within our community. But the ripple effect of making some of those choices, we don't have the time to do the analysis to do that well. So this represents kind of a step, and this is this is really borrowed slash stolen from our peers uh, in Oyster River. Um, Oyster River has been doing this for the last couple of years, where they include this in the back of their school calendars, as much as a heads up for staff, administration, boards, as we think about when we schedule events, to just be thoughtful of, for example, you know, I can think of times in my career where um, we realized a day before an open house for a building that I was on Yonkers for. It was like, you know, you know, when we decided that we had to the day before open house, we decided the appropriate move was to open house and reschedule. Uh, and um, this is designed to, it's not foolproof, but it's there to be very present for us and be thoughtful about the different uh, the different folks who are in our community who uh, we want to be thoughtful as we schedule events and, and do things and, uh, that we are thinking about them as well as part of our organization. So, um, so we'd like to include this on the back uh, as a first step, and would like would be very interested in a bigger conversation a year from now about um, being thoughtful about the inclusion of more days that would be connected with other traditions. Okay, are there any questions, Lisa, Paul, and then Liz? Um, I was curious at some point the city council had asked a motion to no longer have public meetings on major religious holidays, which would cover pretty much everything on this calendar. I made a motion that passed the school board that we would follow their lead on that, but I don't know what the status of that is. I don't know if they've updated their meeting calendar, but if they have, I'd like us to try to update ours as well. And I'm really appreciative, Zach, that you are thinking in the direction of trying to consider the events planning around some of these holidays, even if we have to keep school open. And I'd like to ask that we also just try to consider, as the people who are ultimately approving dates for things, have some accountability around that. Because we still have like a lot of tests and a lot of big field yes. trips and a lot of big events every year on all of these holidays. And it does put, from an equity perspective, you know, like we also probably shouldn't be having like our big, you know, 
food, you know, things yeah. happening yeah. during yeah. Ramadan. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. plenty yeah. of things exactly. we could do, yeah. but we yeah. don't yes. get it that right that often around this stuff. Sure. And I love that you're starting that conversation. And, 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 this is, and these are long conversations, yeah. right? And and these are conversations that, um, yeah, these are long conversations to create awareness within organizations about the need to do this. And then inevitably, these are also conversations when, well, you you guys know you went through this, and I wasn't around for the Columbus Day dialogue in this in this community. Um, I wasn't around part of that, but there's but there's inevitable pushback as you do some of that stuff, and that's okay. That's a conversation I think that's valuable to have because we want to make sure we're inclusive of, of all of our families and all of our staff members to the, to the extent to which we can. Particularly if they adjust because they don't like have a lot of flexibility around what type of absence you have and how much yes. time you have to make things up. Yes. And they have very strict yeah. rules around that. Yeah. So creating some respect for people's different religious observations would be helpful. I actually wanted to ask a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, I had a question specific to that. Um, that's why I brought it up. Um, I just I wondered if we do uh, as a member of the policy committee. I, I I should know this, but I don't. Um, if we have a a special type of absence for religious holidays or religious observance. Is that a special category? And I, don't, and I don't know the answer to that okay. either, whether it exists, but I haven't, I haven't fought in school districts where that is the case, that there no, was an excuse absence for religious I believe it's excused, but it's to do with the high school with how much time students have to make up the work, because yeah. the policy is it's due the morning you get back. Right. So if you are observing a religious holiday and something right. happens that day and you have to turn it in in the morning, right. you're right. not that's observing a religious holiday. Right. So that's that was yeah. the question. It's good one for you to know. The policy. Liz, um, I have a couple of questions and then a comment. Um, and as far as this calendar, this sort of proposal on the back, it says designated non work day for observers. I assume that the calendar sort of just um, identifying that for observers of that holiday, um, it would be a designated not work day. We're not saying that we're designating those as non work days for observers. Like they would need to use their time off or whatever. It currently, is. still under the we We're not trying to say that currently under the They would still have to use like personal time. Okay. To and, um, and so um and so my comment would be um as a state employee we get two I believe it's two swing holidays that we can sort of use how we want to um so if we wanted to observe I think we don't get Columbus Day off or uh, Native uh, Indigenous, Indigenous Peoples, Peoples Day and so if we wanted to take that off. We can um, uh, use one of our swing holidays for that or for religious reasons or whatnot. So um, I don't know how that's built in the teacher's contract, but I would just sort of throw that out there as an idea. Another thing um, about subs in these holidays, like how that plays into um, us being able to get substitutes. But um, I'm a big fan of separation of church and state. So this is my major comment. I'm a big fan of separation of church and state. Obviously, within our calendar already and traditionally has been Christian holidays. Um, but I'm not in support of having this whole list on the back of our calendars going out to all parents and students. I do think that it creates confusion. I think we need to keep it strictly to what are our days off in school? What are our days in school? Um, I think it'd be great to have a list like this for all admin and teachers so that they could see, hey, you know, um, um, my students from India are not here today and you know what maybe why not or maybe I want to celebrate the, with the class and teach about you know Koli or uh, uh, you know something within this or Diwali within the list um, but um, I, I guess I am have this on the back of our calendar I think it's confusing it's even confusing to me looking at right now are you saying like as if this is a non-work day um are these holidays I, you know I think there's going to be confusion as to whether the kids have the day off or do they not have the day off um and so I would suggest to keep the keep it plain and simple keep it as is and provide this to staff and and admin but um keep our uh, school calendar as is I like the idea of building in um, other days off that aren't just Christian holidays, um, but I am huge separation of church and state. So ideally, um, you know, it would be what it is. If we were able to lessen the confusion with some, through some 
approach? Is it about the confusion or is it about the se separation of church and state? So I think we it's less both confusion. to me. Okay. Yeah, I think it's both to me. I think that our our role and the school's role is to provide a calendar. I think, you know, obviously there's a ton of discussion. When's the last day of school? When's the last day of school? You know, maybe having a, something on the back of the calendar that says, this is what snow days look like. Yeah. This is what um, half days look like. This is what we expected for early, you know, early release. Yeah. I think parents need that information. I think this confuses and, and, you know, sort of to me, it's like, okay, are all the kids getting these days off or all the teachers getting these days off? I think this is good for our town to have on our website or, mm -hmm. you know, or for teachers to know or for celebration purposes and sort of incorporating all students. But I mean, um, again, you know, I think, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I think this is a bit confusing and it adds too much confusion and there's just, you know, too, there's a lot, there's a lot there, so. Sure, I would just say, I think in terms of thinking about it, I appreciate that is the, I think there's a desire, there's a lot of people with a lot of traditions whose, whose traditions are in the background someplace. And I think part of what we're trying to do is to bring forward those people's things to the, to the front of our consideration, even if we're not changing days yet. At least like it's out there, we're aware, um, and maybe we can take an incremental step of our own like awareness and thoughtfulness about those. Yeah, within, our, within our school community, but I just don't think for parents and students, I think this is confusing. I think they need a school calendar that's clear about what, what do we do on half days? What do we do on snow days? What's our last day of school? What's the expectation there versus uh, a list of holidays? Thank you, Liz. Yes. Um, I, too, am a big fan of separation of church and state, and um, I'd like to talk about the Pledge of Allegiance with regard to that. But, um, <laughs> but uh, for now, I agree with you about more information about what a half, when or half days and, and, uh, and more, the more information and the clearer that information can be presented, the better. And I wonder if your one of your concerns, at least, about the confusion could just be resolved by giving us a, a title that was more specific, right. yeah. um, that helped people understand what yeah. a little bit more clearly what this list was. Mm -hmm. And it was not things we had adopted yet, but that, yeah. we, you know, that, that these are things that were maybe that it's used for planning purposes or that, you know, you're hoping that yeah. um, eventually we can incorporate some more of these dates into our calendar. Harry and then Hope. Um, the, um, kindergarten start is that different, and usually that's included on this calendar. And um, it, if there's an opportunity to put more, it would be great to have start times incorporated with this, and therefore the early release times, mm -hmm. because they're different at like the elementaries. Um, they all have a little different start and end time. So I so okay. well so we so we, so we so we want to end that practice. Uh, uh, we looked at ending that practice. We had, not do well, we, we, we were having that conversation like on August twenty seventh this year, uh -huh. and, and decided it was too late. The handbooks were out, uh, okay. and that we and we had an interest. A couple of different things. One, making sure everything was perfect. Starts and end times are exactly the same. And we wanted to expand the amount of time between the end of elementary and the end of high school so that we had less bus congestion. Uh, and then ultimately decided that we were like a couple of days away from go time. And everything had already been put out, employed made, you know, plans around childcare and stuff. And it was just that it was going to be too big a lift for families. So our intent is to have all those things in line and create that separation um, for next year. Could that be incorporated on this with like elementary eight to two thirty early release days, twelve thirty release, or something like that? So it's all in one place. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So I want to follow. I do think the early release times need to be posted. I get that question. Yeah. Every early release <laughs> for every school. Every school. <laughs> because my, my kids have been in every school. Yeah. And so I really would like to see that. I also would like to um, let people know what the rule around snow days are. Yeah. You know, that yeah. if the state is still allowing for two, then what happens? Do we go to yeah. remote days or whatever? Yeah. Like, what is our 
policy within the district around yeah. snow days. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a common question since we have SD snow day here. It would might be nice to have a asterisk and some definition of that. Regarding April break, this is trying to compare to the to the old calendar. Usually we roll into May, but I think that's just because of the way that the fourth week fell, because it is always on the fourth week, right? Am I right? Crazy for thinking that, even though it usually falls into May and it's not right. this year. Right. But we we didn't move it up. Did no, we? we didn't move okay. it up. It's to the way the calendar fell. Okay. And then I I I echo Lisa in that I love that what you're trying to do here and hoping you know, I do think this definitely needs to go to all faculty and staff a hundred percent. I think if you're going to add anything to the back of the calendar, um, I agree with Liz, it needs to be pertinent info that's mm -hmm. relevant to our school calendar for this year. Okay. Um, but if you're going to add this, it, I would take off the bottom information here because that does create confusion. Mm -hmm. The asterisk information and the, yep. the pound hashtag. Okay, sure. Um, and as Pip said, like make it very clear that like we are just honoring these holidays, you know, with hope and for movement in the future. And maybe even just add a link, like, hey, love to hear your feedback on <laughs> or, <laughs> or something, you know, as you're trying to gather how we look at doing it the following year. But um, otherwise, I, I do agree with. I just don't think people look close enough anymore. Really, sure. to, mm -hmm. I think it can raise a lot of questions of like, oh, are we getting all these days off now? And, <laughs> you know, sure. don't read. So I think your intent could turn into a disaster. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but a hundred percent think it needs to go as in with yeah. with information around it to teachers. I don't think it just needs to be given as a list. I think it needs to be given with the intent of what we we're expecting that these be honored for test taking. And when you're planning an event, you need to think about, are there people that's not eating this week um, yeah. because yeah. of religious reasons and take these traditions into account. Not and by sense. the way, if you have any questions around what these traditions are, please contact X. Mm -hmm. Don't go off and humiliate the student in front of everyone asking ignorant questions. <laughs> okay, thank you, Hope. Lisa, Ann. Um, so I, as I'm thinking about the suggestions for like just essential facts to be included, if we're gonna do that, there's a few other things that are quirky with our schedule that nobody ever knows until they happen. Like I think sixth grade has a slightly different start than the other two grades. Ninth grade has a slightly different start than the rest of the high school. I have been puzzled every time there are midterms at the high school because I have a ninth grade. I don't know that those are all half days until my kid shows up in the house. <laughs> and I think these are probably things that once you are more aware of it, you know. But I would like to take like a really good audit where there's a possibility to just be, let's think through when are the kids not in the building and whenever that is, it should be on here. I think <laughs> and like when it's so planned, I, so you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I think it's not planned. The challenge is, so, so this is a different format than, than I've used. Right. But I've tried a bunch of different formats. And once you get in, because when you're trying to create a singular district count, Right. You start to run out of real estate. But you're talking about flipping it over and having like the times for the early release days and like yeah. the dismissal times and yeah. stuff. And I'm just saying like knowing that they don't even have school that day would be good to know or. Right. So <laughs> I, it's hard if some of those are put on the end of quarter of the trimester. Yeah, too, right. Got weather events right. yeah. that yeah. wiggle those. And it's, oh, we're supposed to be January 15th. And now, what do you mean now it's the 17th? Even though Can we just have a working Google calendar that's shared out on our website that somebody could update? Well, we've got calendar. There's fitting issues. I know, that's what I mean, like condensed into an district calendar. <laughs> <laughs> So, so there's layers. All right, so let's just say there's, there's layers to all that. I can, I'm sorry. Okay. And had a comment. I just sorry. wanted to agree with what Pip said and what Hope said in regard, in regard to this, you know, with the changes that we talked about that. I think it's really super important for the 
school community to, to know that. Yes. Mm -hmm. so well, teachers and all of that. And, uh, and I know uh, periodically here in Portsmouth, the Jewish holidays, uh, any of the teachers that they got that time off anyway. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure they probably still do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other comments about the calendar? So this is intended as a first reading. Okay. Next meeting is the second reading. Okay. So we, do we vote on it? Next time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We do vote on it. So next time we will vote on it. I, okay. I do okay. appreciate pushing out that first early release to the end of September. I don't know who did that. Line, but thank you yeah. for that. The goal was to have less. Yeah. Less breakout. Yeah, I still renew my uh, request too to start school on a Monday, so we don't have to get childcare on a Monday uh, or take a day off. But uh, okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay, let's move on. Um, consideration and approval of leave of absence. Did we do that already? No, no. no. We need a motion to um, leave of absence. Do you want to talk about them first, or is that necessary? Uh, I think. I mean, we we discussed some in in Mount Public, but we're ready to use. No, I think I'm. No, I think I'm going to stick to what we talked about. I think the challenge with these is for people who are watching TV is these are connected to personal. Can be personal, connected to personal events and could be met, medical or tangentially medical. Mm -hmm. um, and I think so to get, I think the opportunity to share with the board the information the board needs to make decisions, I think is a non public and I think is an appropriate place to be. So that if we have someone who is, um, for example, going out on maternity, um, to just have the board know that for the board's purposes, they understand that for the public, it's not necessarily we want to put out. Public, that someone's anticipating the return of on X, Y, Z date. Um, so I don't know, I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve Sean McGrimley and Nicole Laramie Thomas's leaves of absence requests. Wait a second. Second. Terry, all those in favor? Oh, we need roll to roll. do the roll call. Liz Barrett, okay. yes. Fifth Clues, yes. Lisa Rappaport, yes. Ann Walker, yes. Margot Peabody, yes. Nancy Claver, yes. Hope Van Epps? Yes. Brian French? Yes. Gary Nolte? Yes. Okay, motion passes. We move on to committee updates. Do we have any committee updates? Oh, so I just wanted to point out that um, in April, we are going to have, according to yeah. what my chair told me, to correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but we are going to have um, a presentation um around lead issues in our community and within the state from dhhs as well as um our own uh kim mcmary it's right from the city of portsmouth and so if anyone has any particular questions around lead in our community um or within the state that you would like addressed please email me i'll send out an email just as a reminder to everyone but um, there'll be a time for Q and A, but it, it would be nice to make sure that um, we get any questions ahead of time too. In that, is that April eleventh or the second meeting? In April? It's the first meeting, April eleventh. Okay, that's right. Yeah. And I have yeah, but Margo has. Yeah, I was going to say Margo's going to hand this. Okay. Yeah. Margo, you're on. All right. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes, again. Okay, hey, I have two updates. Um, the first is from the mayor's Blue Ribbon Sustainability Committee. Lots to report there. If you haven't seen the news, we did um, successfully hire a contractor um, for the Climate Action Plan, which is very exciting and has been um, a long time in the making. So there will be a lot of community events and reach out similar to our strategic planning process to have um, full involvement in that. On things more related to the schools, um, I am really happy to report that the 18 bike rack, 18 bike holding rack that was gifted from Sabre to PHS has arrived and is in place and is being well used. I saw uh, last week and it was exciting to see so many bikes on it. And I know that was a long conversation 
that relates back to our goals of lowering our carbon emissions and encouraging more healthy pathways to school. Also related to that um, committee, I am, I have been honored to be working with a profoundly um, uh, inspiring group of students that are involved in both Eco Club and then the Seacoast Students for sustainable, st Sustainability, and that includes kids from all over the Seacoast, not just Portsmouth, as well as members of the Portsmouth 400 for the rollout of the Earth Day kickoff and the Day of Action. And the kickoff, as you well know, is on April 21st at the Connie Bean Center from four to seven. And there's all sorts of activities planned that are so family focused, not only in terms of education, but in terms of just being together as a community and deciding what it is we want for the future of Portsmouth and how we are gonna take care of it. And there'll be music there. There's hopefully gonna be some food. There's even um, a vendor coming that you can take small uh, electronics and things of yours that are broken and they fix them for no fee. So all in the theme of reduce, reuse, recycle. And then following that, the next day, Earth Day, is the big first, Portsmouth's first true day of action. And big kudos to the students. They have worked really hard to make a big push to get our students and families involved. And so next week, you'll see messaging coming out. Our elementary students are going to be um, encouraged to take part in community neighborhood cleanups and then go back to their schools and do uh, wake up the gardens for the spring. Our middle school students will have the opportunity to do some um, pretty down and dirty, um, really important work on all of our public fields. And all of those activities will have Eco Club member, high school members hosting. And then the final activity will be getting the planters ready for downtown. Um, given the late storms that we've had, we're gonna postpone planting them, but we're gonna round up the supplies. So um, lots going on there. Again, check your emails. There'll be Google signups going up for those day of action opportunities. Second update um, I have is um, I wanna thank Pip and Brian who have stepped up to help out with the ad hoc superintendent evaluation committee. We have had three lengthy meetings so far, um, and we've taken a really comprehensive look at, um, we, we watched the New Hampshire School Board Association webinar on superintendent evaluations. We collected uh, sample evaluations from all of our neighboring districts, what they do, when they do it, what their timeline is, how they do it. We looked at um, multiple articles and standards across the country and um, really talked about what is a thoughtful evaluation. What's the information that we need as a district that Zach needs to go forward in the work that he's doing? Um, and what are the key components of said evaluation? So we've landed on a, um, a really great rough draft, first draft that we have shared with Zach for his initial feedback and a rough draft of the timeline. And in um, two weeks, we'll be meeting with him to get that feedback. After we gather Zach's feedback, we will get to a point where we will have a modified draft two that can go to the board for edits and feedback. And um, we are gonna be well within our, um, our timeline to allow for really thoughtful and effective feedback. So um, all the minutes of those meetings are posted. And again, if people have questions, we, we will have ample opportunity for board members to comment on that. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Margo. Hope has a question for you. No, not a question. Oh. I had one more at that. Oh, we jumped to her. One. Okay, Margo, thank you. Um, that was very comprehensive, and you're working hard with the students at the high school. So thank you so much. No problem. Okay, okay now we have Hope. So um, from the music committee, I just wanted to say this Thursday is the Chamber Music Event at 6 p.m. at um, Portsmouth High School. So there'll be some great music going on there, as well as uh, lots of desserts. <laughs> Anybody wants to drop by? Thank you. That sounds good. Okay, I just have Zach and I are going to meet with our assistant mayor, Joanna Kelly, and we're going to talk about what we can do as a city to promote Rachel's um, racial justice and um, all kinds of um, events or activities that maybe get the school department involved in with the city to promote. You know, Portsmouth is the open door city. Portsmouth is the 
city that welcomes all kinds. Um, so we're hoping that the schools can get involved with that and we'll do a big event or several big events or uh, we'll see how that comes up. We're bringing with the city to talk about that. So we'll keep you posted. And I think Lisa Samir understands that's a long, that's going to be beyond events. Events are good, but it's a long term project, right. both for the schools and for the city of Portsmouth itself. So, so can I yeah, just put out one more thing? Um, in a couple of committee meetings that I've been in, it's come up. So I just wanted to put it out to the board at large and especially for you and Zach as you guys are meeting more with city council. There's some more collaboration I think happening this year and some past years um, of how we can really get, we, we, I think we do a fairly good job of getting the word out about our community events to our school community, but how we can really get the word out to our larger community. Um, especially so people can start really seeing where their tax dollars <laughs> are going. And I mean, there's so much good work that's being done. There's so many great events that people can bring, you know, their families to, their grandkids to, their loved ones to, their enemies if they want. <laughs> um, their enemies to. And it doesn't just happen around the holidays. It's all through the school year. So um, our committees were just brainstorming maybe some ways, you know, we could partner with the city on their website sometimes to drop some numbers. So I don't yeah. know if other people give, give some thought about that or in your conversations with the city, if maybe we can think about how we can open up communication more to our taxpayers so um, helping them see That's what true. they can get out of their schools. Always, always good. Yeah. Thank you. Liz Ian. Yeah. Um, I do we still have a school board member on the 400 committee? I know no. that um, the teacher uh, or prior teacher representative on the 400 committee. Do we still have somebody else? No. no, we never I thought we had, had. We never did. We never did. Um, no, I thought, I thought the teacher it. representative. Anyways, I wanted to sort of add that um, that um, I know I signed up for it, so I'm not sure exactly where I found the link. Uh, I think it may have been sort of shared on Facebook, but as part of the course with 400, um, the PHS Clipper Band is having a reunion and um, they're going to be at the parade. And so it looks like they have, they've had about 200 marching performers, 40 walkers, seven ride-along players, and 14 ride-along waivers sign up to do it um, in different sections. So the, the instrumentation is limited, but um, that's a part of the Portsmouth Pro Hunter that I think is going to be a lot of fun that the Clipper bands, everybody that's been in the past Clipper band or band geek has, uh, is now going to reunite and our powers are going to align. In the <laughs> what do you say? So, I mean, I played tenor sax, I also played tuba and I played the drums. So, um, you know, maybe I'll pick up a piccolo. I don't know. Maybe it's your marksman. I'll do a few. I just need to march with a two. That, that was yeah. no, the end. I was responding to what Hope had said that the city who has a loop line to send out every week. And, and, and that, but with that city newsletter, I, I knew why the place was so busy tonight and where everybody was going to be. But it, it also, tells about other events so that would be a, a good place uh, to, to let them know school events that could go that oh, that's a good idea that, and anybody who wants to get there you just sign up and you get a little section okay thank you Ian. does anyone have anything else they would like to add to this I think about what group this great group tonight two tools Carrie, uh, I don't know if the legislative committee is going to be working on it or if it's separate, but I just want to remind people to start thinking about um, New Hampshire School Board Association proposals that the call will probably, I think last year came out in April. So mm -hmm. if there's anything that we as a board want to introduce as a new initiative. Okay, you were very involved in that last year. Thank you very much. So, um, if you you know let us you know we'll all be you were aware of it, but if you in particular see something, let us know. Um, you have some experience with that, so I think it was just our timing last year that was that we didn't really know what we were looking at and the the meeting schedule. So we'll have to just put some meeting time maybe to yeah. have a discussion with that in the next okay. bit. Okay, yeah, we can put that on a future agenda. Okay. Anything else? Okay, do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Hope, oh, second. Second, and all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
Um, bye, Margo. Bye, Brian. Bye. 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 Stay well. Okay.